I'm here today to be the voice of over 15,000 big cats in backyards throughout the United States. And so to recognize that statement, I'd like to say hello as a tiger. <sighs> and now I'm going to ruin your childhood. <laughs> in Disney's The Lion King, who was the rightful heir to Pride Rock? Was it Simba or was it Scar? Well, most of us would say Simba because that's how the story goes. But as it turns out, it's the lions with the darker manes in coalitions or groups of lions that have the highest level of testosterone, the best health, and overall mating dominance. I grew up wanting to be Tarzan, not just because he could speak to animals, but he could speak for them. I'm also from the crikey generation. <laughs> and it was... Steve Irwin's idea of being a wildlife warrior that empowered me to pursue a career in conservation and dedicate my life to saving animals. During college, I was able to travel to Africa and study big cats. Now, when we flew in to Johannesburg Airport, it was a four-hour car ride to Kruger National Park where we were doing the research. However, the scene outside my window was very different from the scene I was used to seeing on TV, on Animal Planet and the Discovery Channel. Vast pride lands were replaced with development, clear-cutting, agriculture, and lonely ecosystems. When we finally got to the park, everyone was on high alert because the night before, a leopard had attacked and killed one of the rangers. See, in places where dangerous animals and people have to share space, the people fear them, and they try their best to stay away from them. It took us about four days to finally track down a male lion in the park, and I had come all the way to Africa to see lions in the wild. And when this opportunity finally came to be, I was able to take a picture of a lion in the wild with a road in the background. <laughs> and so this story and this photograph represents our need for big cat conservation in the wild. In fact, of over 30 subspecies of big cats on this planet, over 80% are endangered or critically endangered with less than 250 individuals left on the planet. So I had walked the path of a wildlife warrior. I came back to the United States and I was determined to focus my career on big cat conservation. Reflecting back on what the people of Africa had told me, I knew that working with them was going to be very dangerous. And I decided it would be in my best interest to spend time working with them in captivity so I could better learn to read and understand their behavior. And it was this decision that forever changed my life and my view on the world. When I first arrived for my six-month internship at Turpentine Creek, a big cat sanctuary in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, I was so excited to be surrounded by so many big cats that I never actually took the time to think about where these animals could have came from or why they were here in the United States. That is, until I started reading their background stories. This is Brody. This is a much more aesthetic picture of a lion, but as all the botanists in the room probably already noticed, he's surrounded by black oak leaves, a tree species native to eastern United States. Brody was bought for $300, cheaper than a cell phone. He was bought by a family with children and brought home to a residential neighborhood and kept in their backyard as a pet until he was too dangerous and too big to be taken care of. This is India. Here in Colorado, we love the outdoors. But what would you do if you were in Rocky Mountain National Park and you were hiking with your family or friends and all of a sudden a tiger walked out of the woods? That seems pretty crazy, right? But that's exactly what India's owner did when he could no longer take care of her, he released her into Buffalo National Forest in Arkansas. But this is nothing to what happened just 10 years ago, when a man let 30 of his pet lions and tigers out in what is known as the Zanesville Massacre. And it got this name from the police officers that responded to the scene, because they had never been trained to deal with exotic animals, and they were forced to euthanize them all. Not only is law enforcement ill-equipped to deal with exotics, but we have no idea of the current threat to public safety. Think about it. An emergency room form has a box to check for a car accident. It has a box to check for a heart attack. It even has a box to check for bit by a house cat. It has no box to check for mauled by a tiger.
Lana's owners understood the dangers of owning a pet tiger, but they decided to declaw her, which is another false justification of having a safe pet tiger. They're meant to walk on their toes. It's what makes them ambush hunters. It's the same thing as sneaking into the kitchen to steal from the cookie jar. So when you physically change a big cat and remove their first digit in declawing them, you actually force them to walk flat-footed and spend the rest of their lives with arthritis. And the big thing here is that it's not the claws, but the jaws that can snap our necks like a pretzel. The internet knows this gentleman right here is Kenny, the Down Syndrome White Tiger. We just knew him as Kenny because tigers can't have Down Syndrome. Thanks, internet. <laughs> so, but the reason why he looks like this, and the majority of the cats that we deal with in the U.S. look like this, is because of inbreeding. So, if a tiger cub is the product, then the breeder supplies the market demand. And just like anything else in the market, the rarer something is, the more valuable something is. So you're a breeder and you start off with mom and dad. You breed them together and they produce a rare and more valuable litter of white tiger cubs. It is much more economically advantageous for the breeder to wait for these cubs to grow to sexual maturity and then either mate them together or mate them with their parents to increase the frequency of getting that more, va that more valuable product. They'll continue to inbreed relatives together to create unnatural and exotic color morphs such as the snow white white tiger and the golden tabby orange behind me. Neither of which would survive in the wild because the tiger would no longer be camouflaged from its prey. In AZA accredited zoos, we breed in captivity to repopulate the wild. We have a specific regimen and use stud books to keep track of genetics and maintain genetic purity across the six subspecies of tigers. Breeders have no incentive to maintain the genetic purity because they're in a market for a to produce cubs. And so what winds up happening is the breeders mix the subspecies together in combination with the detrimental genetics from inbreeding and they've created mutts that have zero conservation value and cannot be reintroduced to the wild and are actually politically recognized as the American tiger. In India, where the last 300 Asiatic lions are on, left on the planet, um, they used to historically share uh, this home range with the Bengal tiger, but the two species never mated. Breeders have capitalized the idea of creating a half-lion, half-tiger known to Napoleon Dynamite as the Liger for its mystical and magical powers into a real thing. This is karma. She's a Liger. She's completely man-made. Breeders made a, a lion and a tiger together, and because of that, she has more health issues than any other feline in the animal kingdom. This all is able to occur because there are no federal laws against owning average citizens like you and I from owning a big cat, from owning a lion, from owning a tiger or a bear, and I know what you're thinking, oh my. <laughs> See, each state is responsible for independently regulating and enforcing rules on exotic ownership. But even in states where it is illegal, the trade still exists and ownership is not monitored. Just a couple of years ago, NYPD responded to an apartment in Harlem with a full-grown tiger in it. And as I recently discovered, growing up on Long Island, I was actually one town away from a man that owned three full-grown African leopards in his own backyard. To, per to put things into perspective, 50 years ago, there were 50,000 tigers in the wild, and last year there were 4,000 tigers left in the wild. But right here in the United States, it is estimated that there are between five and 7,000 tigers with only 6% in zoos and 12% in sanctuaries. So where are all the other tigers? And if we can find them, where are they gonna go? Big cat sanctuaries like Turpentine Creek rescue privately owned big cats and give them a second chance. They spend 365 days a year dedicating their entire lives to caring for these animals, 
to taking care of all the lifelong health issues associated with inbreeding, and to build and maintain them their own habitat so that they can spend the rest of their lives like a wild animal and not like a pet. Providing for big cats, or how we like to say it, working for big cats, means that you have no holidays and you have no weekends or day off because they don't understand that concept. It also means that you work outside in every single weather condition imaginable. So I encourage you the next time it snows and you're complaining about going outside and shoveling to imagine what it's like to shovel out 30 enclosures full of snow that a 300-pound cat has been walking and peeing on all day because it takes a very long time. But we would do things like this with a smile. See, I learned something working at a sanctuary. It's unlike any other business. See, every single cent and every single dollar directly contributes to giving these animals a second chance at life. When you first rescue a big cat, they're fearful of humans and often aggressive. But when you let them out into a habitat and for the first time, they feel grass. And for the first time, they feel space and freedom. They change. They change back into a confident, fearless king of the jungle. And in the sanctuary world, this changes us too as people because we directly contributed to this transformation. And we didn't do it by supporting false conservation organizations like roadside zoos. We didn't do it by taking a tiger selfie. And we didn't do it by playing with cubs. We did it by giving a tiger a life that it deserves. Your consumer decisions are extremely important to impact the exotic pet trade. Any zoo that you are contributing to or visiting and therefore giving them your dollars should be accredited by the associations of zoos and aquariums. And any sanctuary should be accredited by the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. Until recent events, the USDA used to have a database that you could go online and you could look up any captive animal facility and you were able to see the inspection reports to see if your hard-earned dollars was contributing to a facility that met all the regulations under the Animal Welfare Act. Or so in really short, make sure that your money was going towards effective conservation. So in light of these unfortunate political events, I'm going to fight fire with fire. If your language is business and cost benefits, then I have some numbers for you. We already said that it, there are 5,000 tigers right here in the U.S. at a low end. It costs $10,000 annually to take care of a tiger each year. This means that the exotic pet trade in tigers alone is costing tiger conservation $50 million a year. For that same price, you can be very creative and simply go on Landwatch or Google and see that you could go to Russia, you could purchase land where tigers used to roam, and you can conserve it and protect it for that same $50 million, enough for more than 12 tigers to repopulate themselves each year. So how do you help big cats? It's as simple as listening to their voice. Big cats actually include four of the cats you probably know. Lions, tigers, jaguars, and leopards. They're scientifically grouped into a specific category known as the genus Panthera. This genus is distinct because these are the only cats that can roar. The ability to roar is a trait used to communicate over massive distances, five square miles to be exact. So if they're the only cats that can roar, and roaring is a trait that is used to communicate across distance, then their voices are literally telling us that they need space and they don't belong in a backyard. So my big idea worth spreading here is that we can adequately address the exotic pet trade here in the United States, that we can come together and we can solve this issue so that we can reallocate our time and our money to effective and efficient conservation in the wild so that my children or my grandchildren or children seven generations to come from now don't have to go to Africa and take a picture of a lion in the wild with a road in the background.
Oh, my God.